In this InspiredInsider.com interview, we talk with John Ford. He has more than $50 million worth of sales from his copy. He talks about what worked, what didn't work, and why. And listen at the end when he talks about what his business cards have to do with picking up girls, which has to do with him being a copywriter, that and much more. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm honored to have John Ford. He's one of the legends of copywriting and direct response marketing. A little bit about John before we get into it. In his 20 plus year career, John has written countless winning controls. He's generated well over $50 million in sales, and I, I had $30 million, and you said that was 10 years old, so it's got to be upwards of more than 50 at this <laughs> point, and has yeah. successfully launched dozens of products. He was personally trained by Bill Bonner and Michael Masterson. He was AWAI, AWAI Copywriter of the Year, has won numerous awards over the years. John, thank you so much for joining me before you go to Paris. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, and one of the questions I put in here is like list any milestones, achievements. And you said something interesting in the document, which is one thing is you've been lucky to train two or three dozen other writers throughout the years that, have, you know, and, and a lot of them you said have become successful. Um, what have you done with them? Um, what impact and what advice have you given them that's really worked? Well, a lot of what, uh, a lot of the people that I worked with, they, uh, they came in pretty green, um, it just happened to be the nature of the opportunity that we met, which was largely through this chance I had to work with Bill Bonner and, and Michael Masterson at Agora and through AWAI. Um, so they were new writers. Um, so I guess one of the things that didn't happen, which was fortunate, was a lot of not, uh, no need to untrain people because a lot of people come in with a certain idea about how writing works, uh, journalism, you know, they. Journalism training is very specific. Journalists come in, and um, and while those are all great skills, they are n they don't apply uh, in direct response the way some people think they would. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that that's kind of the anti answer to what you're asking. Yeah. So that, you have a clean slate. Uh, so what do you do first? Um, almost always, when somebody comes in, we get them to start looking at where their what happened before them. Um, look through the the greats, uh, which is kind of easy. You know, that's a no brainer. You would go and you look for Claude Hopkins and John Caples and those guys who are the classics, and uh, more recent guys, Bob Bly, Clayton Makepeace, uh, some great guys out there. Uh, Gary Ben Savanga is somebody that people um, often don't know about until they get into the industry, but uh, he's a uh, fantastic source. Yes. Um, and then we make sure that they look at copy that worked. Uh, classic promotions and and uh, the things that are mailing right now in whatever area they happen to be writing. You know, I work in the financial newsletter industry, which is a very big part of the direct response industry. But there, there's a lot of other stuff out there. Um, people who write for nonprofits, people who write for health products, um, then different kinds of health products. Um, people who write for one-off products that are sold through direct response. So uh, we always encourage people when I'm working with somebody who is not going to work with me in the financial area, um, I encourage them to narrow down to what they're most passionate about, because um, that matters too, and to sign up to get on those lists and see those promotions. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this in the financial area, we do the same thing, but in the areas that I know that they're going to be working. And then um, they get those, they read those, we try and get them to write out the copy. By uh, hand? By hand, which is a very valuable exercise, and then I think a lot of what happens from there. Um, these are people who are all working with me, trying to mentor them through, and so I work them the way that the people that mentored me work, which right. is they get a project and they work on it and fumble through and we cross things out, and then we go back and we do it again. And as they do that, we just uncover the things that they need to learn. You know, yeah. that I like to then it's more subjective to who they are. Yeah. So, do you remember the, any student coming back to you and saying a piece of advice was so impactful and kind of 
allow them to break through or a piece of copy allow them to break through that you recommended they look at? Uh, well, a lot of people have said that about just this idea of writing out copy that somebody else has done because you can learn um, you learn in a way by osmosis. You know, there's, there's one thing that's valuable about studying theory and what people say works, um, but it's, and there's something else entirely about doing it hands-on and actually trying and failing, which is very important. Yeah. Um, but this thing is kind of a bridge between the two. You just pick up theory without realizing you're picking it up. So yeah. I, I would say that's probably the most repeated thing. If someone is in the financial niche, I guess, what would you say, where should they start? What's the one piece they should actually just do this, for, write this one out by hand first? What would you tell them? Well, if, if they're in the financial uh, niche where I am, which is in the newsletter area, because there are other areas, mm -hmm. um, like the uh, people who write for things for mutual funds might write a bro yeah. brochure or something like that, um, or who might write for a financial magazine. So yeah. it would be different. So yeah. if you were going to go... Yeah, well, newsletter is good. That's pretty widely okay. applicable, yeah. Well, let's say in the, news in the newsletter area... Let me go wider first because okay. these are um, these are things that I think would be useful for anybody. Sure. Um, anybody out there would probably want to go find Ken Fisher's original uh, stock letter. It's just like two pages, but um, they, he ran that ran that for years, and I don't even know what the headline is on, on it because it was very generic. Uh, but nobody could beat it for something like two decades. Wow. Um, what would you remember that was he, in it that was so good? It, I don't, you know, this is terrible to say I just recommended it, and I can't remember it. The last time I looked at it was in the mid-90s. Okay. And, uh, and he approached me out of the blue and asked me to rewrite it uh, and offered me an, a nice chunk of money, and I thought, oh, I'll do that. But I was so overwhelmed with other stuff, I didn't do it. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, that, that ran for a very long time. Then a uh, definite piece that everybody will know is the um, Wall Street Journal control of, uh, of the tale of two investors. Um, which you can find readily anywhere all over the internet. Mm -hmm. um, but that is probably one of the longest running financial mail pieces. Yeah. What one has well, uh, been favorite to you of yours? Well, well let, me, let me answer that. just the last part of oh, the question. Ahead. In the newsletter area, um, I would say promotions that somebody, everybody has to look at would be if you can find it, uh, and sometimes you can on Amazon, there's one called Plague of the Black Debt. Okay, I haven't Which heard was, of that. Yeah. That was written in 1993 or four by a guy named Lee Euler. Um, it was one of the first, if not the first, uh, bookalog promotions in, uh, which is why you can find it on Amazon because they sell it as a book. You can get it for like five cents. But it's uh, masterful copywriting by Lee Euler um, for a newsletter called Strategic Investment. Then there's one that probably everybody's heard of because you couldn't have escaped it was this uh, end of america promotion that was put out by the stansbury guys and written by mike palmer mm -hmm. um that is a brilliant piece very well done um i think what shocks people most is how long they long it is how long is that one because when it runs in an uh, a video sales letter format it's about an hour and 20 minutes wow um on paper it's about 60 70 pages something like that which stuns people but it it worked very extremely well. Yeah. Um, so your favorites of your own? <laughs> my own. <laughs> um, well, I you know there's some that I like that that probably didn't work as well as I'd hoped, and then there are others that worked pretty well. Yeah. Let's talk um, about both because I, I want to hear your thought process and maybe why it didn't work as well as you thought. Uh, well, some of the ones that didn't work as well as I'd hoped was one I'd done a while ago about. Um, uh, Called uh, just blue gold was the headline, and it was about investing in water stocks and water service companies, and mm -hmm. um, just because I I tend to like these resource related stories, I just think that there's a lot of history involved, and that's I, I get to read this stuff that's not exactly financial literature. It's it's like the tale of you know somebody old. This one had things about old ranchers having uh, gunfights over the source of the Colorado River and things like that. That's just kind of I don't know, cool history that you get to yeah. weave into it. Um, but uh, that one did okay. It wasn't bad. And, and uh, there were some that tried to reassure me that it did pretty well. But um, 
but it didn't it wasn't gangbusters like I'd hoped it would be but um, what I liked about it was that it told these stories and it was about something so fundamental and it's about something that is a big deal because we face big water shortages coming and this guy was saying you should invest in this stuff yeah. the stocks that were related went through the roof they were they did fantastically well they were some of the best stocks you could have owned in the first decade of this century so um, but it just didn't, I don't know, it just didn't take off. Um, some of the ones that did pretty well, I did one, uh, a really weird one at the end of the 90s when everybody <laughs> felt like Y2K was going to uh, take off. Right. Um, we had a we had a uh, financial editor that we were working with. His name is Gary North, and he is a, traditionally kind of a doom and gloomer, but he was really, uh, he really sincerely believed that Y2K was going to be a, mega crisis just like it's hard to remember now but many people did um, and he had what he figured was the uh, ultimate scenario survival plan but so we had to make this case for Gary's pitch um, and it was a tough challenge because what he was predicting was not like you should own this stock or that stock he was saying this is it this is like the end of humanity <laughs> so, oh really yeah was he was that really yeah, he was like the entire all the So what do you pitch if it's no end of power. humanity? He had, he was a really a, like a survivalist. Um, okay. But uh we tried we wanted to make this case and yet at the same time uh CNN and MSNBC and everybody they were also running these doom and gloom scenarios for Y2K. So we had to sound different. Um and it wasn't hard to find proof because Gary was very serious about this and he dug up a lot of very good proof and um, so we did, I did one that was called, uh, the silence of the trains. Okay. And it was just on, it was back in Magalog's pre internet stuff. And, um, and we had a, a picture, I had a picture of a train track. I had just driven past some train tracks that were in Baltimore. I was still living in Baltimore at the time. And I guess I moved to New York, but, uh, railroad tracks coming around the corner and the whole thing started out kind of like a movie scenario. And it was about the train that didn't come, coming around, the, rattling around the tracks, the 502 carrying um, you know, various goods and things like that from across the Midwest. And it built up from there about the trucks that didn't come and the shelves that weren't filled and the hospital that couldn't open and all this other stuff. Um, that was kind of fun to write. Um, and it was fun to see how everything was connected largely to the electrical grid and the internet and things like that. Then there was another one I guess I liked for, um, it was called When the Lights Go Out in Paris. This was another doom and gloom thing. But this was, uh, there was a surge in uranium prices, um, which did follow this promotion. Um, talking about how it's a good time to invest in uranium. But instead of saying it's a good time to invest in uranium, we looked uh, I say we all the time because I'm usually collaborating with somebody who's helping me figure this out, the editor or whatever. Um, so I looked over to uh, France where France runs now on about 80% nuclear power. At that time it was about 70%. So it's a big deal in France when they run on, on nuclear power. It looks great until uranium is expensive. So right. our logic was um, it's going to be very expensive to light the lights in the city of light, which as an aside, really doesn't have anything to do with light. It's about uh, philosophers and things. That's why it's called City of Light. But anyway, the City of Light um, depends on uh, uranium being cheap so they can run it off nuclear power. So that was our pitch. So we talked about the lights being out on, on Champs-Élysées and all this other stuff. So again, it's the same kind of thing. You see it build up from this tiny little scenario into a big one. So in that kind of piece, how do you get the word out? Is it What's the avenue? You do you mail it, or what does it what does it look like? I guess to the consumer. That one was also back in that was pre um, pre internet sales letter, pre video sales letter, and um, we I, the one that uh, I talked about the silence of the trains went out looking like a magalog, like as a magazine cover. Okay. That other one went out uh, as what we used to call a faux issue, which was like a fake newsletter issue in a number 10 envelope that said your your special issue enclosed you know uh, when the lights go out in Paris a lot few people are going to get very rich and that's yeah. all it said on the cover and then the inside the letter um, so that was a good one then there are like a couple along the way I, 
I've written tons of these predictions packages okay. uh, about seven shocking events of the coming year. It always starts out the same way. But they're always fun because you get to kind of take every every uh, news item to the extreme and imagine where it could go. So, so what were what are some of your uh, shocking predictions? What what um, um, actually came true and what didn't? Geez, these would be in the well one that we the one, one that I worked on in the ninety three or something ninety two was talking about the total information society. Okay. Where everything would be connected and um, we would have devices, wearable devices that tracked our health and all this other stuff. Um, obviously, that's coming true. Yeah. Uh, another one was we were just trying to get a little crazy with it, but we uh, there was a mad cow disease scare was out. So we thought, well, what, could, what else could happen? And we, uh, I, <laughs> I really kind of made this up on my own, but uh, mad chicken disease, where we were talking about... <laughs> it doesn't how, sound so scary when you say it like that, mad yeah. chickens. So uh, the the logic was that uh, mad cow disease is caused by uh, protein, eating brain proteins, really. Yeah. Um, so what the, this thing was predicting, what it eventually led to was a biotechnology stock that was, uh, or somebody, a biotech that was working on what we would do after antibiotics stopped working. But um, the mad chicken disease was saying, you know, we're all looking, talking about this mad cow disease and about how we feed the cows their own bone meal and things like that. Um, but um, the way we raise chickens is equally, if not worse, disgusting. Uh, and, and the runoff from the chickens and everything, it's yeah. all going back into the food system. And yeah. we're running this risk of all these uh, potential diseases from food. So um, I guess that was a sort of a precursor to people being more concerned about GMOs and about yeah. the way foods process and all yeah. of this stuff. Yeah, so I remember that, watching Food Inc. and uh, I think I went vegetarian right. for like several months after that, right. <laughs> after I saw right. that. Exactly. Yeah, I thought of that when I watched Food Inc. too, that scene with the guy who raises his own chickens. Yeah. I know there were a few other ones, uh, but I, I can't remember what they were. Yeah. Um, we had the... the um, Hundred million man march in China, okay, which is the idea that the uh, Chinese have been killing off their female babies and ice, having uh, families restricted to one child has raised a, to a terrible imbalance of males to female ratio in China, and they have no jobs for these people, so they have to build these factories that they can't sustain. So, how do you weave um, the Weirdness? sale and pitch into that? Like what? It, <laughs> it was it was tricky. Um, and I'm like not I'm sure. I'm on the edge of my seat, like wondering what the story. Yeah. But I'm thinking, wait, what are they even selling? Yeah, the further that? the further. I think that the the ones where we could go further afield are harder to do now than they used to be because um, people get so much. I don't think people's attention spans are necessarily shorter. Uh, if you if you grab them, they will listen for a long time. Yeah. But um, I do think that the onslaught of people trying to get their attention is greater. So their chance to choose to pay attention to you is uh, restricted. So I'm not sure you can do that as well yeah. these days as you could then. But um, the way I, we, we, I would weave in a sale would be, uh, especially with those predictions packages, for instance, it was almost a formula. You'd start out with this wild, wild view. Um, now, I don't know if you, if you got to ever get a chance to look at that Great Leads book. Uh, that I put together with Michael Masterson, but we talked about the six types of lead types, uh, six types of leads, and uh, sometimes you're going after a prospect that has a lower level of awareness, um, an extremely low level of awareness of you, of the product. Kind of like even, blue gold. I think you yeah. talked about this in blue gold, right? Right. Even the problems that they that the person has. So you need to find a way to get their attention that is so out there that you'll be able to get the people who are very far away from you to pay attention. Um, this is kind of this bold, uh, this this bold proclamation type of pitch. That's what predictions promos are. So in these predictions promos, that's what we were reaching for. This really way out there kind of thing that would make someone say, "What? Wait, what? Right. Pay attention." So they pay attention, and they come in and they hear what you have to say, and you provide 
some proof, but it has to be fascinating. And then gradually, as they're fascinated, you kind of weave it in a little bit of a hint saying, you know, and this is, this is like, you just allude to it. Um, this is exactly what I was telling my readers about such and such, uh, you know, why, uh, when I gave a warning that said this. And then you back away from it. Then you go back to something wild. Then you come back and you say, as I told my readers when I recommended such and such stock, and it turned out very well, the performance was uh, XX percent. Um, and in fact, we do that quite often, as I'll show you in just a minute. But let me tell you what else is also going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then each time you return to talk about it, you talk about it a little bit more mm -hmm. so that um, they become more willing to listen to you talk about yourself because at the moment you're talking about the things that might be fascinating to mm -hmm. them. Um, then they gain, that's when they gain your trust. So really the answer to that question is that each time the way you weave in the sale is uh, you just remember that all that stuff that you're doing is not um, just there to shock or entertain but also to make them, make it clear to them that you are trustworthy, worthy, to show them that you are somebody that will be interesting and they trust you to be interesting and interesting as a source that you've done your homework. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why that stuff is really there. So uh, you develop a sense for when that level of trust is built enough that you can start then sharing the stuff that they would otherwise not want to hear because it's just pitching. So. Yeah. And I feel like, so are you a big fan of TV and movies? Because they, you know, they probably kind of open loops and close loops. Is there, right. is there anything you see out there that you think, oh, wow, they do an amazing job of this and you learn something from it? Well, I, um, to be honest, I, we haven't, uh, my wife and I haven't watched that much TV in the last 14, 15 years because it's all in French. So it's it's uh, makes us tired. So, you know, most people sit down when they're tired to watch TV. Are you fluent in French? I can get by. Okay. I can have a conversation and things like that, but it does wear me out still because I'm still yeah. translating some in my head. Um, my wife is better at it, but we have to work to watch French TV. Mm -hmm. um, so now with Apple TV and stuff, we've picked up you know, we're catching up with things that people in the U.S. watched a long time ago. But I am a big fan of movies, um, always have been. And uh, I I don't know if I could single out one movie in particular that did it really well, though um, there are definite movies about, like, the writing life that I tell people to watch, maybe a little bit uh, genres that not everybody would like. But, like, mm -hmm. I always tell people to watch Barton Fink and mm -hmm. uh, Tin Men and things like that. Those are good things about writing and selling. When I was asking you about a fun fact, you said you love humor and you're, you're pretty much all kinds of humor. And you talked a little bit about methods that you use and you talked about the South Park people too. Can you tell people about that? Uh, what did I say about You said the um, they were sitting in on a New York writing class and they were using certain techniques like um, uh, certain lessons, I guess they'd write, have a deadline and things like that that, that you also do. Oh uh, gee, I hope I can <laughs> remember. I know I did. I know I did see that. I can see the video in my mind. Um, I guess I'm bringing that up because I'm wondering what some of your big lessons are for uh, well, kind of the guidelines can, you follow. I don't know if I could tie it direct to the South Park thing because I don't remember everything they said. But I bet they said these things. Which um, one of the things that I know they do, and that the Pixar guys do, and uh, you know, when now we have kids, so we watch a every animation movie that comes out. Um, one of the things that I know that they do is uh, storyboard things and try and give them, they try and work out the uh, progression of the story and the plot and e everything gets unveiled in a certain way, just kind of the way I was just describing with these predictions promos. It, you have to do it at a certain time. If you do it too soon or too late, um, you lose them. So that takes a lot of work to make something seamless like that behind the you know behind the scenes so that in front of it nobody can see this where you stitch things together in the right. structure and I think that writers who who do stuff uh, to get into this they don't appreciate that as much as they do after some years of writing and they can get discouraged early um, because they realize that that structure building um, takes a while to learn and then it takes a lot of work to implement once you do know it but Gradually, you realize once you're committed to a writing life, you realize it's worth it. 
to work that stuff out. So that's one thing. Not everybody outlines like that, but a lot of the best people do. How do you know whether um, to follow that, you know, follow that structure and be rigid or to kind of use your creativity and branch out from that structure? Like what's an example, I guess? Uh, well, I think um, there's one other thing I want to add about the comedy thing. Yeah. So I'll come back to that. But um, I think that that uh, a good analogy for that is when you look at the art world and you see somebody like Picasso, you look at early Picassos and late Picassos, and everybody looks at those late Picassos and say, well, you have to, all you have to do is know how to make triangles and weird angles and all that stuff. But right. if you look at the early stuff, uh, he mastered the early stuff first and then built from that. I think, you, um, I think what you have to do is master that structure first. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, then you you'll know when you can deviate from it because you understand that you are deviating from something. Mm -hmm. It's just when you try to deviate without any understanding idea where you're, where you're right. coming from. Yeah, right. You you can't take a shortcut unless you know what you're cutting from. <laughs> so yeah. Um, the other thing is uh, uh, about the comedy guys. Um, a lot of what is funny is taking something that is known and familiar and pairing it up with something that is surprising something else that's known and familiar and the combination of the two is surprising that uh, in, in comedy classes and things like that they'll tell you to sit down and write down what familiar situations you have and familiar situations that like someone in the audience might have mm -hmm. and then try and put them together in funny ways and try and look for ways to bridge that gap so it's better than starting from scratch with nothing. And that's why when somebody's so funny, you know, you laugh and then you think to yourself, it's funny because it's true. I mean, mm -hmm. that's become a cliche response to what's right. funny. Um, it's that trueness that you're looking for. And the same is true in, in sales copy, even though we always say that humor doesn't exactly work in print because you can't be sure that the person reading it is going to get the joke in the same way you do. Um, it is true that what uh, largely what you're doing in creative copy is combining what that reader already knows with this new thing that you want them to know. You're finding a way to bridge that gap. That's mm -hmm. how you explain things. So. Yeah. So what's one of those where you weave some humor into your copy? Do you remember any good? Uh... Uh, I tr I actually tr I I actually try to. I was just saying I try to avoid uh, humor too much in copy because. Um, people who are reading it, they can't see your intonation and uh, you know they can't see your gestures and things yeah. like that. Or you may be writing from somebody that, while they understand, while you understand how they're upset about something or they feel about something, um, you might not understand all their other experiences. So I might use an analogy in comedy that's not. But what I, what I where I think that uh, being funny is valuable to copywriters, and I I don't. I can't really think of many copywriters who are not that funny. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's several who I've talked to in this copywriting series that are were professional comedians. Yeah, so well, we have a, um, I have a group of friends in Paris where we we try to get together when we can and and do um, improv. Okay. So, uh, I mean, it's just just for fun, but it's an exercise. I think that when you get uh, copywriters together and they they talk to each other. Um, it's it's that sense of how funny things can combine that becomes valuable to them when they are uh, sitting down and trying to figure out how to make analogies and explain things to people. Mm -hmm. A lot of what copywriters do is take something that is either complicated or could be described in a very dry way mm -hmm. and make it fascinating yeah. long enough that the person will be there for the sale at the end. Yeah. So. And John, I've, I want to talk about some of your mentors, kind of your influences from early on and, and later. Um, can you talk about your, the influence of Bill Bonner and Michael Masterson and what great advice they gave you? Uh, well, um, Bill is a very interesting character. Uh, and he's, he's not that well-known. Michael Masterson is obviously extremely well-known among a lot of copywriters out there because that course that he put together is very well-known. Um, Bill is more of a, he's a he's more like his personality, which is um, 
not necessarily shy, but he keeps to himself. He's an introspective type of person. He's a very good writer, and he's got kind of a writer's personality. Um, so when I when I uh, first met him, I was actually interviewing for an internship at this Agora Financial Agora Publishing, and uh, he came to the. I happened to be there on a day that they were having cake for birthday. Okay. And at the time, they had under thirty employees, maybe twenty five employees. And uh, they everybody came in and sang happy birthday, except this guy who stood at the back of the room and didn't say anything. I mean, he just kind of smiled, but it was like he didn't really feel comfortable singing in a group. And Then he left, and then somebody mentioned Bill Bonner, and I said, who's he? And he said, oh, he was just standing behind you. <laughs> so uh, that was Bill. When I started writing copy with him, uh was purely accidental and maybe too long a story to tell here, too, but... Um, Never too long a story, only because we have limited time, but I can sit through uh, the... Go ahead. <laughs> uh, all right, I, I'll see if I can condense it, because it is a little bit funny. I, yeah. I was working there as an intern, um, wanted to just get into a publishing company because I like to write, and I thought maybe this is a way to make a living writing, because um, you know otherwise it's a it's the kind of meager existence. Um, <laughs> it's put a lot of people in the... The poor house or in the in the gutter with a bottle in their hand kind of thing, <laughs> but um, anyway, so here I was, and I wanted to learn to write, and um, the company hired me to then write articles for one of their as an editorial writer, and one day uh, in this office, uh, a girl from the production department was going around she 's a rather attractive girl, and I was young and single at the time. Um, she came over and said something about wanting to do a business cards for everybody in the company. And did I want business cards? Well, I didn't even have a title at the company, and I'd been only there a week. But I thought I should probably have business cards. Um, I go out with my friends to happy hour. I have no idea how to talk to women. I was just totally helpless at it. And uh, figured that business cards were somehow supposed to be part of this equation where I handed them out and that would be a good idea to have some. So I told her I'd like to get some business cards. So it's just strictly for, for women purposes. Strictly, yeah. Strictly a motivation of a 23-year-old or 24-year-old, however old it was. Um, and she she said, okay, I put my name down and all this other stuff and filled in the position that was going to be on the card and everything. And I figured that uh, Bill Bonner had been started out as a copywriter, which is how he started before the company was launched. Uh, so I put down copywriter on the business card. <laughs> and she came back about a week later, dumped the cards on my desk, and Bill said, John, did you just get business cards? And I said, yeah, I, you know, uh, I just never had any. And he said, Oh, I've never had a business card in my life. I just don't use them. What did you, you know, what did you put on there as your position? And I said, a uh, copywriter? And he said, that sounds good. Let's train you as a copywriter. So that's how I got started writing copy. And I, Bill would just hand me, we would get together once a week. He would sit down and make a list of the different uh, products that needed sales letters. And um, I just took... I took a, you know the first project, which was about a tax investment newsletter. Wrote uh, six pages of copy. Bill walked up, he looked at it, he crossed out the first five and a half pages, <laughs> handed it back to me, and said, "You could start here." Um, and that's pretty much how he wrote a lot of the. He would what was written. He would cross out what he didn't like with big slashes, and I just try it again. Um, not a lot of direction, but a lot of he would give me stuff to read. Uh, and things like that, or he would have an idea for a promotion, and he would write the first, the headline, and the lead, and then he would say, "You fill in the rest," and then hand it to me, and I would take a shot at it. So it was a lot of trial and error, um, and then we st started hiring other writers and training them. And Michael Masterson, who, which it's okay to say now, is this, this is Michael Masterson is his pen name, which he wanted to use for his uh, for his books about the business, uh, and Mark Ford, he's no re no relation, just coincidental. It's spelled differently, Mark, right? Right. Yeah, yeah he's, I have an E, he doesn't. Uh, Mark Ford was um, came along and helped to consult the company 
uh, uses Mark for his literary stuff and his other business stuff. Anyway, so Mark, um, he helped Bill formalize this training program. And uh, at the time, I was the only copywriter. Then I hired somebody, and then we hired some more. And that training program that developed between the two of them, we would get together uh, at the end of a desk, at the end of a big table in a conference room, Bill at one end, Mark at the other, and we'd go around and talk about the projects we were working on. Uh, and Mark had a teaching background, so he formalized a lot of stuff into the theory. And Bill, Bill was uh, more like the guy who would show up the examples and then talk about the examples at work. So between them, we got a lot of theory and a lot of examples. And um, that gradually became the AWAI program. Oh, really? That, okay. Yes. Yeah, so that came out of our Tuesday morning meetings. At one point when Mark was yelling at somebody who was not, not done their work, and he said, you ought to be paying us to do this. And then somebody at the table thought, that's a good idea. Get people to pay to learn to be good copywriters. So the course was born. But anyway, they, um, between the two of them, I would say that, that what Bill taught was a very large macro kind of view. Um, and what Mark taught was a very precise detail-oriented view about the structure and about mm -hmm. some of the rules of headlines and things like that. So what advice did he give you? Uh, Mark was, um, I don't know if I could codify it as a thing, there's so, there's so many things, uh, but Mark was very, he's very much like the line edit guy, uh, he would go through and he would, he was about tightening up the writing, um, trying to say things as simply as possible, uh, look about the structure, thinking very much about the structure, um, I would say, uh, it's hard to remember who came up with which different lessons. Um, I would say, for instance, one of Mark's things was about um, when you start out, you have to set a hurdle for. So you have to imagine that the thing that you're selling is going to cost ten times what it is uh, that it's actually going to cost, and you have to sell to that higher price point so that you feel like it's a serious bargain when you get to the offer at the end. The other thing. Um, that I believe was Mark's uh, thing was where he talked about at the end in the sales off uh, close, you want to have a, um, he would say a dissolving bonus. You want to have like a little extra thing that just removes all the extra resistance. Uh, and Bill actually used to talk about this too. He'd call it the false close. This is a, uh, the reference we got to it from the movie Tin Men where um, you would seem like you're about to say, no, isn't that a pretty good deal? Just sign this reply form. But you would get to that, isn't that a pretty good deal? Oh, and then there's one other thing. It's kind of like the Ginsu knife thing, too. Right, right. Um, where you keep the throwing info commercials. In. Right. So that by the time you get to the end, the person is like, I really want this. I really want to order. Uh, but you keep giving me more stuff. <laughs> you know, so, um, so that was a, those are some points yeah and i know we're running out of time i want to i know you've had a very successful career what's been a challenging moment or low point for you um a challenging why well, i think in that document i mentioned you know just some some personal the personal th kinds of things that happen to people you know where you it's hard to focus on writing writing is a uh, hmm. even it's even though we're not writing novels and things like that um it's still a writing life and a lot of it happens inside your head uh, that means that when you leave to go home, you even if you leave your laptop or whatever at the, in the office, it's still in your mind. So you're constantly writing. Mm -hmm. That can be good too because you know you can ideas pop up. You know when you're in the shower, or when you're drifting off to sleep, or when you wake up and things like that. And um, that actually sometimes makes it entertaining because you get these problems that you get excited to solve. Well, the downside, though, is that uh, when your head is occupied with other things, um, your main, your best tool uh, is not there for you. So, yeah. um, you know, personal things like losing family members and yeah. friends like that, which has just happened. Those have been some of the low points. I guess, uh, but professionally speaking, um, the thing that always kills me is when I put a lot of time into something, and I think it's a great idea. And everybody else thinks it's a great idea, and then it doesn't work. Um, and that happens. That happens no matter how much experience you have. It's going to happen. Um, it's frustrating. 
Yeah, it's frustrating, and you have to uh, you have to bounce back from it because you can obsess over the thing that got messed up. Right. Uh, you know, it can it can make you doubt your ability to do this stuff. You know, I think there's this even a syndrome they call like a, the faker syndrome, the faker the imposter like, syndrome. Yeah, yeah imposter yeah. syndrome. Yeah, you feel like you're faking it. I still feel that way often, especially if something doesn't work. Oh. If you feel that way, then I'm sure everyone feels that way. What was something that everyone thought would work, you thought would work, and it just didn't? Um, let's see. Well, we had something last, about two years ago, I guess, we did something. I worked on it all summer. Um, it was after this uh, End of America thing did very well. And I think a lot of people in the industry were... Um, they were excited because it meant that you could do. It was it was uh, evidence that you could do really well with direct response stuff, and you still the lists were out there and responsive. But it was depressing because it's kind of like being a golfer in the days when Tiger Woods is dominating the course or playing basketball when Michael Jordan's still playing. Because right. you you think it doesn't matter how well I do, I'm never gonna I'm never gonna grab that spotlight. Um, I think a lot of writers felt that way, and I was trying to come up with my own version of the um, the war, the uh, end of um, end of America. And this was about the time that people first started worrying about the NSA stuff and about um, Wall Street. Had, you know, it was not long after uh, the, the the banks and things like that. And and my sense was that a lot of people out there felt like um, they were being boxed in on every everywhere they turned. So you get nickel and dime by everybody on uh, in doing business with insurance companies and um, Wall Street and things like that. You get uh, boxed in by rules that won't let you do things. And meanwhile, people are spying on you and um, the NSA is reading your emails and things like that. And it was just, it just felt like uh, everywhere you turned, you're a target. You're the, you are the sucker for everybody. Um, yeah. And I had had a mental, I had had an image. I used to do some design, and I guess sometimes I think of these things visually. I was thinking that if it had been a Magalog, I would have wanted to have a picture of, of a person who's just like one of our readers, and uh, with a with a uh, target, or a little red dot, like a laser dot mm -hmm, on his forehead, mm -hmm. kind of like looking up. Right. And the, the title of it was going to be the, the War on You. And it was just about that way, that feeling that you're being boxed in from all sides. Um, and the pitch was a, a newsletter that was, was about privacy concerns and all these other things. Um, mm. But it just proved to be such uh, an idea that was just too big to tame. And uh, too many aspects. And I got really into it. Um, spent like two or three times the usual amount of time writing it. Um, even though I was on vacation uh, with my wife and kids in Greece and I was getting up at four thirty, five 5 o'clock in the morning to write wow. and then up until lunchtime when I would go and kind of hang out with them. I even um, strained my elbows. <laughs> I mean, uh, my, you know, the tendons or whatever from all the typing. You were and, serious. Uh, had a I serious. I had to do special stretches and everything because my arms wow. hurt so much I could barely answer emails after it was done. But um, it just was meh. You know, for all that effort, it didn't. Wow. It didn't pay off. So what I ended up doing was I ended up breaking it into pieces, and I managed to make a whole second promotion out of the back half of it, which did end up doing very well. Okay. So it was redeemed. But yeah. I think I would have been very upset had it not done that. Yeah. John, I have one last question because we're right at the quarter two mark. I want to hear your proudest moment and also where people can check you out and check more out about you and, and your work. Uh, proudest moment? Well, I guess other than you know helping some of those other writers come along because there's some have done pretty well and I, I like doing it. I like teaching yeah. uh, people. Um, there was a guy who was a, a, an editor for us. He was in his 80s, and his name was Kurt Rishabacher. He's now deceased. Um, but he was an economist, um, a very serious guy, a uh, European guy, um, wrote very densely, uh, but uh, was a big thinker. And the world had kind of have 
kind of passed by his kind of serious insight. And um, we largely published his stuff uh, because Bill Bonner admired him uh, considerably and, and he wanted to make sure they had a, an outlet. Um, but we'd never been very good at selling his product, um, partly because the price point was a little bit higher and uh, partly because he was just, you had to be pretty smart to read this guy. Yeah, pretty intellectual. Yeah. So um, we tried and tried different ways. And, you know, some of them might have worked, but they weren't really true to him. So the fulfillment didn't work, and it just wasn't just the way, way, way we wanted to sell him. Um, so somebody came along and they said, look, if you could sell him, we'll, give, we'll double your royalty on it, and, you know, we'll see what we can, see what we can figure out. So um, I poured through all of his stuff. I took all kinds of notes and learned his uh, thing. I, I met him a few times for lunch. He's a really iconic character. Um, always wore white suits, and he had this cane with a little silver tip. Really, white suit? A white suit? Yeah, yeah. He wow. was a really, really interesting guy. Um, drove like he could barely walk, but he drove like a maniac. <laughs> That's scary. So, um, anyway, so I, 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 uh, I learned all this stuff about him personally. I talked to him about his family and you know, his wife. Um, uh, was deceased and he had lots to say about that and um, anyway kind of got to know him and then got together with an, a, another guy who knew him pretty well and we came up with an investment plan based on his economic outlook and said you know if he were to invest which he's not going to recommend any investments these fit perfectly with what I'm about to tell you that kind of thing mm -hmm. uh, but we put together this promotion that did really well for him I think it was a two or three million dollar wow. Uh, promo. So I was kind of glad because it was sort of a last hurrah for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's nice. So where can people find out more about you and um, check uh, out your stuff? Well, I would say uh, I have been for the last dozen or so years putting out a weekly newsletter, mm -hmm. uh, e-letter, it's free. I've read a bunch of them, they're very good, yeah. Uh, Copywriters Roundtable and um, it's a little different I think from some of the other things out there because uh, I when I when I write it I'm really writing it for myself somewhat because I like to read these things and I just kind of take notes in uh, e-letter form yeah that means that it's probably loaded with uh, typos and things like that which people always write to tell me about <laughs> which uh, that means they're reading it carefully though so that's a good thing yeah I guess yeah. I guess so um, and there's a, a website for it too. It's called the Copywriters Roundtable. So copywritersroundtable.com. Yes. I mean, I, I prepare people for the fact that I don't put much effort into the aesthetic of it or the business side of it. Yeah. There are ads therein, but I rarely change them. I mean, it's the content. It's really, yeah, it's really there because I just like to do this yeah. stuff. So if they're interested in reading it and the same kinds of yes. stuff I am, yes. they can find it. Count copywriters roundtable, all one word. Yes. Um, uh, tragically, without the appropriate apostrophe on copywriters, um, it's hard to do in a so, URL. Exactly. Yes. And then um, there's that book, the uh, Great Leads book that I did with Michael Masterson. That's on Amazon, and uh, I think there are a good number of articles over with the people at AWAI online. Yes, there is. If a you bunch. just search, yes. search it. Yeah, there's some yes. things there. And I'm always at the boot camps. Yes. I know boot camps. So. John, I appreciate your time. I know you're super busy. Everyone should check out copywritersroundtable.com. I knew I wanted to have John in for so long. And I knew even more when I read your about page or your meet me page, who I am page. And I'm not going to give away what it says, but that hooked me right away. So anyone <laughs> has got to check out the who, am, you know, who I am page on Copywriters Roundtable to get a sense of your sense of humor and your your copywriting. So I, I love that page. That's one of my favorite <laughs> articles I've read uh, out of all the ones. So I appreciate cool. your Thank time. You. Thanks. Well, it's nice talking to you. Thanks, Thanks John. Have a Take safe care. trip. Okay, bye.